afternoon, Hans, <laughs> Baltimore. Okay, um, it is my distinct honor to present two Women of Action Awards to the two wonderful women up here, so I will just get started. In 1998, Carol Estes was named by the League of Women Voters as a woman who could be president, and I don't disagree. Carol Estes is a leader in the study of aging policy in the United States. She was one of the first advocates for crediting women's unpaid care work under Social Security, and she has written more than 200 scientific articles and chapters, and co-edited and authored numerous well-received books on aging. Her credentials are a mile long. She is a professor emerita of sociology at the University of California, San Francisco. She is also the founder and former director of the UCSF Institute for Health and Aging. She's a member of the Institutes of Medicine and the National Academy of Sciences. She is the president of the Gerontological Society of America and the American Society on Aging. And for more than two decades, Dr. Estes has served as consultant to the U.S. Commissioner on Social Security and both the House and Senate Committees on Aging. Or please join me in honoring Carol Estes <laughs> with the Now's Women of Action Award. Thank you. What an honor. Having um, grown up in the, uh, in the 60s uh, and had the excitement and opportunity to be in the early days of the women's movement and the founding of now, this is uh, just unbelievably a cherished moment. Poet Adrian Rich says, the most important thing one woman can do for another is to illuminate and expand her sense of possibilities. Three women did that for me, my mom, Maggie Kuhn, and Tish Summers. How fortunate could I be for a girl who never had a female professor in all my years of higher education? Mom was 12 when women got the vote. She went to school in a horse and buggy in Stephenville, Texas, graduated from college, got a master's from Columbia University. I was a junior in high school when she read Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique. It unleashed a torrent of anger and um, depression. But connection. That year, Mom's first murder mystery, Eve's Do Dropping on Death, was accepted for publication, and she was writing a second one. She taught me that writing a book was doable. It was okay for a woman to write. But sadly, what I saw next was that she could be coerced to stop writing. Stop her else, she was told by my dad. It was like Maya Angelou's caged bird singing all too briefly. Mom's daily lament, she said over and over again, is it's a man's world. Her struggles taught me about the larger relations in society, male dominance in particular that could and did control her and my life. I grieve so much, even today, that her vitality and enormous talent were suffocated in rage and self-destructive loathing in full circle and in direct connection to the roots of now. Years later, I was privileged to know and work with Betty Friedan on gender and aging while a visiting scholar at Stanford. Two other women mentored and profoundly affected me, Maggie Kuhn, a remarkable crone and co-founder of Grey Panthers. She understood not only what she was living for, but what she was fighting for. It was all about age discrimination and social justice for all generations. She understood the links between ageism, sexism, racism, militarism, imperialism, and wars on the poor and middle class. She showed no signs of self-censorship or nagging fear voices that plagued me inside and that today hold so many women and girls back. In Maggie, I saw up close a courageous, charismatic communicator calling out our sick society. While talking heads would ask her, almost 
pathetically why she never married, Maggie would cheerfully respond, just lucky, I guess. <laughs> Her lessons included, do your homework, get to the root of the problem, go to the top, the power elites, and speak your mind even though your voice shakes. And finally, a well-placed slingshot can topple giants. And remember, everything is connected. Another now con connection is Tish Summers, an early member of the now Task Force on Midlife and Older Women, who later co-founded the Older Women's League. She insisted on the feminist analysis and gave us her mantra, don't agonize, organize. We are at a precipice now. Uh, we are if we might say, the mother of all gender struggles, race and ethnic struggles, class struggles. And these issues starkly underscore the importance of social insurance for all generations of women and for all families, and the peril of the choices that will be made in the near future. And we face a legitimacy crisis of democracy in which democracy which stands for the social rights of citizenship grounded in the notion of life force interdependence is being challenged by market fundamentalists who would rather see a privatized citizenship tantamount to a market morality where individual responsibility is substituted for social morality or responsibility to community and society and to the national and global commons. We face a serious threat, as Catherine Summers has talked about, of the right to have rights. The risks associated with being female and growing old female are increasing in intensity in terms of the threat of poverty, discrimination, and unrelenting pressures on women to give care until they collapse or die. Our nation's long-term care policy is that women do the work they do it without pay or low pay and no benefits, and they do it at great cost in terms of financial, physical, emotional, and psychological ill-being. We are witnessing another war on women, and it is a war on all generations. Of course, this war has the facet, a very important facet, of a war on older women. Attacks on Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid are a war on women of all ages, and particularly so for racial and ethnic minority women. Attacks on women's health care under health reform are part of the same cloth. To a point, two points bear noting. One, women are more dependent than men upon the nation state, and this is true across the life court. Women are acutely vulnerable to the larger political, economic, and global forces that are restructuring the welfare state in the U.S. and elsewhere. And second, the degree of dependency of women upon the state increases with age, widowhood, divorce, all forms of singlehood, and the spending down of the totality of women's savings and physical, emotional, and psychological reserves as a consequence of the work, the lifelong work they do. Now, you wonderful women and men, you and your fabulous president, Terry O'Neill, are a leading light and voice in this fight against the war on women. Terry's voice is powerful, compelling, and courageous. She and we all must and will work together. There are others of us, the, the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare, whose board I have served on and been chair of for some period of time, are in this fight with you. And we produced this report, Breaking the Social Security Glass Ceiling for Women, and we are rising together with other organizations the Institute for Women's Policy Research, the National Women's Law Center, the Older Women's League, Great Panthers, and others. Together, we will be part of the one billion rising, and we will make the difference. 
Maggie said, I'm closing now, that do something outrageous every day. So here's my outrageous act of the day. At the core of, of the real social security crisis and deficit mania is masculinist thinking embedded in the dominant rational man economics that undergirds the logic of privatization and the worship of the individual. Masculine assumptions take for granted and do not count into the economics of U.S. productivity, either the gender disproportionate opportunities to work and to be educated and the differential race-based opportunities to work and pay into Social Security and the essential contributions paid and unpaid across the life course to reproduction and our society. As feminist economist Nancy Faubert said, the invisible hand of the markets depends on the invisible heart of care. Markets cannot function effectively outside the framework of families and communities built on the values of love, obligation, and reciprocity. She also notes economists are not interested in this. In closing, I dedicate this award to my daughter, Dusky, and my two granddaughters, Bridie and Mackenzie. Dusky is making waves as an award-winning chef and advocate for sustainable food and against hunger. Her experiences speak volumes about the barriers that women still confront in one of the oldest jobs of women around the world, cooking. Thank you, we must do this together. Our next award recipient is Dr. Bernie Sandler. Lifelong gender equity activist and the godmother of Title IX, Dr. Sandler filed sex discrimination complaints against more than 250 universities before there were even laws prohibiting sex discrimination in education. In 1970, she was the first person to testify before Congress about sex discrimination in education and she worked to organize the hearings that documented sex discrimination in employment and education. Dr. Sandler wrote the first ever reports on campus sexual harassment, gang rape, campus peer harassment, and the chilly climate on campus for women, especially Latinas and African Americans. She has given thousands of presentations, written several important guidebooks, and more than 100 articles, and she has served as an expert witness in discrimination and sexual harassment cases. I have the distinction of being one of the only biologists she's ever met. She might not remember. At Maryland Now's Women History event in March, I had the distinction of being sat at the same table as Dr. Bernie Sandler. She didn't know who I was, I knew who she was. And I turned to her after I gathered up my courage and I said, I just have to thank you. I'm one of the STEM girls. And she said, oh, really? And I said, yes. And she goes, well, what was your field of science? And I said, I was a biologist. And she goes, well, I've never really met a biologist. And so we had a discussion about what it was like to be an undergraduate biologist. And then I said, but you know, my sister's a scientist, and my dad's a scientist, and I have aunts who are scientists. And she paused for a minute, and she turned and looked at me, and she goes, you weren't socialized properly, were you? <laughs> with Alindra uh, on that particular occasion, and it meant a lot to me, and I don't think I said this to you, Alindra, is at one point in my life I wanted to be a biologist. <laughs> and somehow it didn't work out. I got the message that was not really appropriate uh, for lots of women. They never said it publicly, at least in terms of your careers for me. But you got the message anyway, and so a lot of the things I had thought about, like maybe being a legal secretary, uh, sort of went by the way. Anyway, thank you so much for this award. I am thrilled with it. Uh, it also belongs to the hundreds of women who gather data on their campuses, often secretively, sometimes not so secretively, but they help make this award possible. Nobody does something like this by themselves. Uh, there are always other people uh, involved. Title IX is the most important law passed for women and girls since women first got the right to vote, which was back in 1920. 
I should tell you that none of us knew how important this law was when it was passed. We just thought it would, you know, get higher salaries for women on campus. There'd be, oh, for athletics, the way we thought athletics was going to be covered. Um, I remember speaking with the other five or six women who knew what Title IX was about, and I remember saying, you know, this is great that Title IX is going to cover athletics. That means on field day, you all know what field day is, play day. <laughs> on field day, there's going to be more games for girls. That's terrific. <laughs> that was how we thought it would affect athletics. Of course, nobody else noticed this uh, uh, either. For me, Title IX uh, begins in 1969. I've just finished my doctorate at the University of Maryland, where I had been teaching. Uh, there are seven new openings, and uh, I was not considered for any of them. And my mother had always said, if something goes wrong, you ought to ask why. And so I followed my mother's advice. I went to another uh, friend on the faculty of that, and I said, how come they didn't even think of me? And he didn't skip a beat. He said, well, let's face it, Bunny, you come on too strong for a woman. Yeah. I went home, and I cried, literally. I cried because I could see I was never going to have a, a, a career in academia if this was true. And I said to, my, said to my then husband, you know, I never should have spoken out in graduate classes. I should have been silent and, you know, not participated. Um, and then he said the right words. He was really good on this issue. And he said, are there any strong men in the department and still weeping? I said, yes, they all are strong men. And then he said the magic words. He said, then it's not you. It's sex discrimination. And sex discrimination was a relatively new word. We didn't have this word. And if you don't have a word for something, you can't really conceptualize about it. And at this point, incidentally, and, like, and at the point when um, uh, there's no word for sexism, that comes after Title IX is passed. No word for sexist, that's afterwards too. There's no word for sexual harassment, that's after, that's about 74, 75. There's no word for acquaintance rape or date rape. That comes somewhere in the mid 70s. And again, naming something is very, very uh, important. We don't know these words, and we don't often uh, think about them. So I want to just give you a couple of examples, very few, of what education looked like in those days. For example, in the state of Virginia, sometime in the mid-1960s, there are 21,000 women who are rejected for admission to Virginia state colleges and universities. Now, would anyone like to guess how many men were rejected? during that time? Somebody call out a number. 40, somebody said? She's got it. Zero. Not one single man was rejected for admission. And I often think of those 21,000 women. And I wonder if they ever got to go to college. And of course, the answer is most of them didn't. And I wonder if the cure for cancer may have been there or some other brilliant discoveries. Um, I knew of one woman. Most women were paid less. Uh, Many departments said, we never hire women in our department. Now, some said, of course we hire women in the department, but we would never get them tenure. And I did know of one woman who worked for very little salary because her husband was in the same department. She was an assistant professor. He was a full professor. Uh, she never got raises. She didn't even have an office until she won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> and then they gave her an office and, and promoted her. <laughs> uh, when Title IX was passed, I really was... Uh, very naive in those days. Uh, I thought it would take about a year to end all of the discrimination. <laughs> you know, we would simply go up to people and say, you know, this is discrimination and it's against the law and you, know, you need to change it. And they would say, oh, thank you so much for this. <laughs> um, if anybody had told me I would be here some 40 years later and know what the, what the achievements of Title IX are and know what the achievements are that still are yet to come, I think I would have wept. But I don't wait because there are people like all of you in this audience who care about what is happening and will make some of those things happen or make them come a little, little faster. Um, there is, I will say, after that first year, I doubled my my estimate of how things, would, how fast things would go to two years and then to five years and then ten years and then I stopped predicting because I know now, as you do too, that Title IX is not finished yet. Um, there is more, there is much more to do than we ever estimated when it was passed because Title IX is not just about ending sex discrimination. It's also a social revolution. It's a revolution which will have as much impact as the Industrial Revolution has had and maybe even more because it's changing the social relationships between men and women, boys and girls. 
we have only taken the very first steps of what's going to be a very long journey for Title IX. Nine. And I want to tell you just what happened a few weeks ago, which sort of gave me a new insight because I haven't quite thought of it this way. Um, someone doing a, a story on Title IX said, you, you have grandchildren down here? And I said, yes, I have two grandsons in college and a granddaughter who will be going to college in the fall. And he said, well, what's been the impact of Title IX on them? And at this point, my heart sank because I wanted to have been able to say something about my granddaughter and her great love of sports. But unfortunately, she played on a soccer team for three weeks and then came home and said, I don't want to do this anymore. I cannot get excited over what happens to a ball. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to so try to figure out, what can I say about Title IX? And, and then it, it came to me because um, my three grandchildren, the two grandsons and a granddaughter, all of them have had friends of the other gender friends who were not romantically or sexually involved with them. That could not have happened when I was a child. I hardly ever spoke to boys unless I was dating them, and even then I was too shy to talk too much. <laughs> so this is totally different. I watched when my grandson, uh, particularly one of them, something good happened to me, he said, oh, I've got to call Amanda and tell her. And this is brand new, and I think what it does say, um, these genuine friendships that boys and girls and young men and young women can have is one of the biggest achievements of Title IX. Entirely unexpected to many of us, and yet that is what all of us in this room are doing. We are helping young men and young women not only respect each other, but also to be friends. And that, as much as dealing and with and ending sexual uh, discrimination, is a remarkable achievement. And our schools, colleges, the nation, and the world will never again be the same. Thank you very much. We are now ready for our political roundtable. Uh, as you know, feminists have suffered a number of losses in the elections in 2012. Losses that gave the Republicans the numbers and the confidence to push their agenda that resulted in the atrocious war on women. We continue to see that even this week where, as we're doing the unbelievable struggles uh, to try to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act that had previously passed with broad bipartisan support and reauthorized with the same kind of broad support. Um, it, now they even want to uh, undercut previous provisions and not include um, the immigrant women, Native Americans, and the LGBT communities. In addition, we have seen an uh, unprecedented number of anti-abortion pr provisions introduced across the country. The Republicans nearly shut down the federal government in efforts to defund Planned Parenthood and deprive health care to nearly three million women, men, and teens. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops caused disruption uh, insisting that only uh, that not only churches but religiously affiliated hospitals, universities, and service organizations be exempted from covering contraceptives, and the House Committee hearing about birth control allowed only men to testify. Uh, Carolyn Maloney asked, "Where are the women? Hopefully, they are coming in the 2012 election when we need to see more women and feminists take office." Making it the year of many women. So I'd, I'd like to introduce our first panelist. Uh, Sarah Reese is the director of the Academy for Leadership and Action at the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. For nearly 20 years, uh, Sarah has been learning, teaching, training, and speaking to people about tested campaign strategies and organizing models gained from her work in the trenches of the LGBT and progressive candidates and issue campaigns. Sarah was the campaign manager on Kentucky's marriage amendment and was the statewide field director for California's Proposition 8 campaign. She'll talk about what's at stake in the election for the LGBT community. Uh, please welcome Sarah Reese. <laughs> um, it's such an honor to be here and to be on this plenary with these ex distinguished women. Um, I am living in D.C. and I work for the task force, but my heart has never left Kentucky, where I grew up, and really learned organizing. 
and I learned it at the, at the knees of the Women of Now and with the folks from the Fairness Campaign, who um, both groups worked together and understood that the linkages of oppression were what were going to take us to equality and liberation. For those of you who don't know much about the task force, we're the nation's oldest LGBT group working for LGBT rights. We're celebrating our 40th anniversary next year. And the work that we do at the task force is to build political power from the ground up. And I've gotten to do that for the last 10 years by partnering with state and local communities to either pass good legislation and ballot measures or fight against regressive ones. And what's at stake this year for the LGBT community, Linda and Ellie are going to talk about the broader what's at stake. And at the task force, yes, there are four ballot measures that are going to be on the November ballot. And we know that the election is more than just those four ballot measures for LGBT people. We're also going to be standing side by side with the folks in Maryland trying to repeal the, stop the repeal of the DREAM Act, the voter suppression ballot measure in Minnesota, and working arm in arm with the ACLU in California to reform the death penalty. We see it as our work as well as making sure that marriage equality um, is the law of the land in four states. Absolutely. So in four states, um, we're going to have the opportunity to pass marriage um, proactively for the first time and, and defend against a constitutional ban um, for the first time in 32 tries, as well as in two states affirm marriage equality that state legislatures passed just this year. So how many of you out there are from Maryland? Yes, excellent. Emily, let's, let me throw the slide up for the contact. Um, so in Maryland, with a courageous governor, Martin O'Malley, with strong support from NAACP, SEIU, and obviously Equality Maryland, the state LGBT group, um, we were able to pass um, marriage equality at the state legislature. Unfortunately, the opposition, as we've seen since 1973, Benita Bryant, no, it was not, they couldn't let it sit, right? So they've collected enough signatures to put it on the ballot for repeal. The good folks at Marylanders for Marriage Equality are working hard, they've opened offices around the state, and they're working hard to build enough support to make sure that on election day, marriage can be implemented in January for folks. I'm one of the lucky, exactly. I'm one of the lucky 18,000 who were able to get married in California in 2008 during those 173 days. Right? And what we know, and, and the key to winning these four elections this year, is that from 1973 to 2001, we thought that um, we lost about 75% of the time when LGBT rights were on the ballot. In 2001, we started taking a different approach, which was isolating four things that we could do differently to start winning. None of these are going to sound like rocket science. Start early, build a big enough team, talk directly to voters, and use the word gay. Be out and honest about what we were fighting for. Right? So we started implementing those things, and we started winning at, local, at the local level on non-discrimination. But in 2008, when we had the crushing defeat in California, we realized that there's not enough natural support for marriage, and that the conflicted voters who think that civil unions and domestic partnership are enough, we haven't connected with them so that they understand why I wanted to marry Kathleen, who's been my partner for 10 years, and, and continue to build a life with her. And so what these four campaigns are doing is they're having what we're calling persuasion conversations. How many of you have done a candidate campaign? Right? We talk about ID, persuasion, GOTV. Well, what we mean in persuasion now, today, in these LGBT campaigns is we're having conversations with people who may not be there yet with, on marriage, and we're talking with them about why they got married, why people they know got married, and connecting it to why an LGBT person may want to get married. We've done ourselves a disservice in many movements, having a rights frame, just talking about equal rights. And at the task force and the people I grew up with in Louisville, we know that equality is the floor and liberation is the ceiling. And unless we connect our humanity, why you want to get married, why I want to get married, why I'm happy I'm going to celebrate my fifth anniversary in November, right? Then that's how we're going to win. So Marylanders for Marriage Equality are doing that. In Washington State, they're doing the same thing. Washington State is also facing um, uh, an affirmation of a law that was passed by their legislature and their courageous governor, Christine Gordoire, this past spring. They passed marriage. The opposition just turned in 200,000 signatures to repeal it. 
the um, Washington for United campaign is working hard to make sure that on election day, marriage is affirmed for folks in Washington state. Minnesota, one is not like the others, it'd be Minnesota, which in Minnesota in May 2011, their legislature, after we lost control of the House and Senate, passed a, a referred a constitutional amendment to the ballot for this November. The interesting thing about Minnesota is they've had 18 months to prepare. It's the longest time any one of these campaigns has had to do that. So they've gotten to start early, build a big enough team. They're out talking about why gay people want to get married. The other thing they're doing is they set a goal of having one million conversations, Minnesotans talking to Minnesotans. And of those one million, 250,000 conversations are going to come from people of faith. It's the first campaign to hire a faith director and employ a faith department to make sure that we're out there moving people from the pews to the polls who care about marriage equality. It's very exciting. And yes. And finally, you know, a first in the LGBT marriage movement is that Maine um, has moved forward proactively. A year ago yesterday, they started gathering petition signatures to place a proactive ballot measure on the ballot for this November to pass marriage equality proactively. That's the good news. The bad news, Maine lost in 2009 by 30,000 votes. So for the last three years, they've been working a systematic campaign to make sure that they find those 30,000 folks, have a conversation, and move them to be with us by election day. In a, in a year, from yesterday till today, they've had 100,000 of these conversations. And I'm not talking about, how can we count on you to vote yes or no on election day. I'm talking about 15 to 20 to 45 minute conversations on the doorsteps of their neighbors. It's been phenomenal. <laughs> All the campaigns are in good shape. They have competent people running them. You should get involved. We have the contact information up on the screen. They need your help. They need volunteers. They obviously need money. Um, and we're going to talk more over the course of this plenary. But we have an exciting opportunity this November. Never before have four LGBT ballot measure campaigns on marriage been on the ballot at the same time. They're polling higher than 50%. That's happening right now. That's the good news. The bad news is we have 130 days. The bad news is they don't have enough people helping out. The bad news is they don't, haven't raised all the money they need to raise. The bad news is TV is going to cost a ton of money this year. They need your help, money, and people power. Um, and I'll be excited to talk more about it. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Linda Hallman. Uh, as director, as executive director and CEO of the American Association of University Women, uh, Linda is a nationally respected leader with more than 20 years of executive level experience. Now in her fourth year at the helm of the 130-year-old membership organization, uh, she has guided the AAUW through the, the financial recession and has increased its funding levels to allow the organization to continue its primary commitment to break through barriers for women and girls. Now is excited to partner with the AAUW in its program, It's My Vote, I Will Be Heard, to promote equality for women by educating and mobilizing critical young women voters in the 2012 election. Please welcome Linda Hallman. And this conference really reminds me of a really great now advertisement. Woman power, it's much too good to waste. That line originally referred to women in the workplace, but this weekend, surrounded by so many powerful men and women and committed grassroots activists, those words take on really new meaning for me. Today, let's talk about what AAUW and the AUW Action Fund are doing to harness that incredible woman power nationwide. There is no better time for it, folks, this year We've asked ourselves too many times if it's 2012 or is it 1952. Yeah. <laughs> the attacks on women's rights have come from all sides and on a variety of issues. Reproductive rights, fair pay, violence against women, health care. These attacks are why AAUW is making a very special high energy investment in turning women of the millennial generation out to vote. That's the backbone of the AAUW Action Fund. It's my vote, I will be heard campaign, and with your help, 
we are going to change the face of elections for many years to come. So let's think about it's my vote, I will be heard for a second. I like to look at this with a little bit of inflection. Depending on how happy you are about things, or maybe how pissed off you are about how things are, you can use inflection for this. It's my vote, I will be heard. It's my vote, I will be heard. It's my vote, I will be heard. Right? You can use it any way you want. Just use it. So, the It's My Vote campaign is a highly targeted 21st century education and mobilization effort. We are distributing educational resources nationwide with a special focus on 15 target states. And just so you know, those target states are California, Florida, Illinois, Massachusetts, Michigan, Mississippi, Missouri, Montana, North Dakota, um, New England, um, North Dakota, North <laughs> Nevada, Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia, and Wisconsin, and uh, we'll, we'll, I'll, we'll tell you that again later. <laughs> you know, no one can write that fast. Um, we're distributing those educational um, resources, and we've been working with our branches and our more than 145,000 members and supporters to hold local town hall meetings, issue forums, and debates. We're supporting voter registration drives and canvassing events, and we've been working on college campuses and with young professional women to ensure they know what's at stake at the ballot box. And critically, we've been building and joining local and state coalitions with other like-minded groups, including the National Organization for Women and your chapters, because it's going to take all of us to bring women, especially millennial women, out to vote this year, and we absolutely need to make this happen. We're working with younger women because AAUW isn't just thinking about 2012. Millennial women aged 18 to 31 represent our greatest opportunity to have a lasting impact on the national conversations around equality for women. The millennial generation is enormous as numerous as the baby boomers. There are about 50 million voters between ages 18 and 31, a huge voting block that shares many priorities with AAUW and now, like affordable education and fair pay. However, millennials have yet to establish a consistent patter, pattern of voting. Remember, voting is a habit. Just because you go once, it doesn't mean once is enough. We have to establish the habit of voting. By engaging with millennial women, we have the opportunity to strengthen the voice of women in the 2012 elections and to support the enormous generation of young women to establish those lifelong voting habits. We all know that what the media is calling a new war on women, the attacks on our reproductive rights, on our retirement security, and on our access to education and employment opportunities, is a battle we have fought over and over again. The only way we can finally close the book on disputes that should be long resolved is for women who know the issues to vote and elect fair-minded leaders. We need women to stand up with their sisters and daughters and friends and say, enough. We need leaders who understand us and know they need our votes. So let me tell you a few things so you, you know. I, in your, in your um, uh, packets, inside, the, we have the congressional voting record, all right? Inside there is the It's My Vote poster, okay? We want to see this up in every library in America. We want to see this up in every, I don't want to care where, any, any public spot. Please take these. Put them up in a spot so people can really see it. We have more. If you want more, we can, you can just call us up at the office, email us, and we will get you as many as you want. But let's be visible, folks. Let's make sure we have those things out there. So the It's My Vote campaign will help ensure millennial women know the power of their own 
voices. So be a part of this exciting campaign. Go home, hook up with your local AAUW branches, and get to work, folks. With your help, I know we're not going to waste this country's woman power. Now, in the back, uh, just raise your hands. I've got two, uh, two AUW staff in the back. They have resources for you. You can sign up with them, coordinate with your local, your now um, chapters, and let's get out the vote. Right? right. Thank you. Founder and president of the, the Feminist Majority Foundation, Ellie Smeal has been on the front lines fighting for women's equality for 40 years. She has been at the forefront of almost every major women's rights victory, including the Violence Against Women Act and the Civil Rights Act of 1991. During her three terms as now president, uh, Ellie led the drive to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. And I don't know if you know this, but she was the first to identify the term gender gap um, and, and have that measured. That's the difference between the way women and, and men vote and popularized its usage in the election and polling analyses to um, enhance women's voting club. Ellie and the feminist majority drew world attention to the Taliban's brutal treatment of, of women in Afghanistan. They led the campaign to win FDA approval of Mifepristone, uh, conducted the nation's largest clinic defense program, and publishes our favorite magazine, Ms. More recently, Ellie organized her votes, a coalition of women's organizations uh, to camp combat attacks on women's health and economic rights by educating women about what is at stake in this election and encouraging them to vote. I am pleased to introduce the passionate, visionary, inspiring feminist, Ellie Smeal. Thank you. <clears throat> That's what I want you all to think about, is how you're going to change what you're doing between now and election day in November. And I'm not kidding. I think everything is at stake. Uh, actually, uh, AUW and the Feminist Majority and NOW are all in it together in her votes. Uh, and we've been actually meeting at the AUW. And if you haven't been on the site of her votes, uh, go on it. It has the 12 major issues at risk. And it's just, it's just unbelievable. We're now fighting for the right to vote again. And this, uh, the right to vote is not just the suppression of the vote in general. As you know, it is targeting people of color. It is targeting young students. And I never thought this would happen in all my fantasies of how messed up things are. It's targeting older women. And, um, and it, it very effectively, because the whole ID thing, you have to have a government issued ID. A lot of older women have given up driving if they ever did drive. And uh, they're demanding birth certificates. If you were married and your birth certificate doesn't match your married name, they're demanding marriage uh, license. Um, and, uh, and it all has to match up where you're currently living. Anyway, it is a process that they're bragging about. In fact, the Pennsylvania, one of the chief uh, Republicans in Pennsylvania bragged about it's the way they're going to elect Romney in Pennsylvania. They should be ashamed of themselves if they have to elect it by anybody by suppressing the vote. Social Security, as you know, they want to privatize. They would love to take off the books Title VII and e Equal Pay. And as you know, they have bottled up the Fair Pay, uh, Paycheck Fairness Act, the Fair Pay Act, Medicare. They want to eliminate, as you know it. In fact, the Ryan budget eliminates Medicare. Do not think differently. It, for all people under 55, it will no longer exist. And of course, you know the people they're grandfathering in, they'll guilt trip and probably change the rules and ruin it too. Medicaid, they want to block it, grant Medicaid. And if that Ryan budget went through, both houses and a president signed it, it would mean 40,000 people in nursing homes would immediately be thrown out. It pays for two-thirds of people in nursing homes, and you know most of them are older women. 
uh, the National Family Planning Program, you know the Ryan budget. We all know that it defunded Planned Parenthood. How many of us have focused in, it zeroes out all money for family planning? Uh, Title IX, uh, you know, we've been celebrating Title IX. Actually, uh, Linda and, and Buddy and myself were on another panel at the Gallup Foundation anyway, just this week. Uh, what I don't think people understand, the attack on Title IX has been ruthless and endless decade after decade, year after year, and what we're currently fighting is the return of sex-segregated K-12 through public schools. And in fact, we now have counted, the Feminist Majority Foundation has been doing a study of it. There are over a thousand such schools where either they're sex segregated. Now, we're not talking about uh, gym classes. We're talking about sex segregation. That's not so good either in these young ages. But what they're now talking about and doing is sex segregating academic classes. They're talking about pink brains and blue brains. It's bad enough we got pink Legos and blue Legos. Now they're talking about our brains being pink and blue. Uh, it's just too much. Roe v. Wade, of course, is on, on the line. If they get the stack, the Supreme Court, you know they're going to reverse it. But this is the one that gets me. And I'm now, I know that some of us are C3, but pardon me, I'm not, I'm talking C4 now, I'm talking PAC, I don't care what it is. Do you know that Romney's, the guy he pointed, to be head of his Judicial Selection Committee is Robert Bork. Oh. Oh. Robert Bork. And, now, I mean, just put your, some of us, unfortunately, are old enough to remember that we fought him and we borked him, we kept him off the Supreme Court, led by the, our dear Senator Kennedy. But I don't think, I, you've got to go on we go on our soon to be, we're going to start a Feminist for Obama site. It's going to be uh, put up. I hope that now joins us on it. And if you go to the judicial selection part of it, we're running the People for the American Way tape that reminds you who Bork is. He's for us for literacy <laughs> tests, poll tests. Um, he doesn't think uh, Griswold should be in the, con in other words, it should be state by state. States' rights on whether family planning would be legal. Um, the stuff is, is a mind blow. And it has a little clip of Romney introducing him as the chair of the special committee here, or whatever it is, the judicial selection or appointments thing, in which he says, I, wishes, I wish he was on the court already. Oh. He's a guy that does not believe that sex discrimination is protected at all, just like Scalia. It's unbelievable. Uh, we have to worry about Griswold now. And as you know, they're trying to roll back the whole family plan. They've attacked it in state after state where the Republicans control the governorship and the two state legislatures. Now, I don't think, and we're going to hand out a handout someplace. I don't know if Alice. Alice Cohen is back there, and I've, all of you know her. She was our political director of now, political director of the Feminist Majority. Alice, why don't you stand up? They're going to hand out. Uh, it's already out. It's already out? Okay, you already got flyers? Okay, I don't know which flyer we handed out. But anyway, I know we were handing out flyers on what the Affordable Care Act stands for. I really think that this will be, in fact, we, should, we haven't said it. Did you love yesterday? Yeah. Save the Affordable Care Act, but if we really want to save the Affordable Care Act, we have to win this election. They are running on repealing it. And the Affordable Care Act is adding 14, 16 million people to Medicaid, well able bodied people who have no insurance and they make less than 133% of poverty. It is adding 30% in 30 million people into the insurance exchanges who are. Uh, which 75% will be subsidized because they make between 133 and 400% of poverty. It mandates that maternity must be covered, and that's prenatal care, and 80% of individual policies right now do not cover it. It mandates well-woman checkups. 
And that's mammograms, pap smears, cancer screening, also for men, uh, and birth control without co-pays or deductibles. But we're celebrating right now the 40th anniversary of Title IX. This puts a Title IX into health care. It has a clause that you cannot discriminate in health care on the basis of sex, race, ethnicity, disability, or age. It is unbelievable. It is the biggest legislative advancement for women since Title IX. And I could go on. I want, if you want a list, you can go to our site and it has a list of all the things it does. I don't think that feminists even know that this is a revolutionary game for all people, it essentially will put 95% of the American public will be covered with health care. And preventive health care is leading it so it won't be so expensive. So please, and there's so many lies. Cancer gets on, that's the, what is it? What was he, is he majority leader? Yes, of the, oh, I don't want to say majority, but anyway, he's the Republican leader. He gets on yesterday and he says, if this, if we have to repeal the Affordable Care Act, First place they were saying it was unconstitutional, now they know it's constitutional. And now they're saying we have to repeal it because if we don't repeal it, you will lose, the people who have health insurance will lose their choice and lose their current health insurance. That is simply not true. Now, we also are handing out, I think this is what we put out, handed out, that's all the things Obama and Biden and this current administration with the help of the Democrats in the House and the Senate have passed. It is unbelievable. And the reason we're doing this, we don't think even our supporters know all the steps for women, children, civil rights, and human rights. And anytime someone says to you it doesn't matter, give them a sheet of paper and and tell them why, with all the passion in your soul, why it matters. I believe that the gains for women of the last 40 years are at stake. You stack, you stack that court anymore, and it will, you'll just see them unraveling. They have told you and us what they intend to do. They're doing it at every state level that they control, and they intend to do it at the federal level, we must change our lives and get out the vote. And getting out the vote isn't just a little thing. We need three to four weeks of your time this fall to help deliver out historic vote. And if you don't have the time, give money. And give money for all the things you believe in. So many people in this room have marched, you have picketed, you have demonstrated, you got to say, I'm not going backwards. I'm going to show them how angry we really are. And so please help the National Organization for Women. You know, give them money so they can get organizers into the key states. I have lists of all the states. We have four referendums for gay rights, gay and lesbian rights. We have four states that are probably going to be considered anti-abortion and reproductive rights uh, referendums. And Florida, we got to win. Um, Colorado has another one. Uh, Montana will have one. We think maybe Oregon, although I think right now they don't have the signatures. Um, and then there are key states. Uh, the sp speaker or leader Pelosi has told us this could be the first election in the history of our country where the majority of the ma a major parties new seat holders and winners could be women. The Democrats could be lucky in the new seats a majority of women. It will not happen unless we get the vote out. And so we are going to be targeting quite a few states. Uh, Linda has said how many their AUW is and we're in partnership with them. Uh, we're adding maybe a few more states to that because basically we can not lose this election. But as I think as Eve says, we can't just think about losing this election, even as a possibility. We can't entertain that. And what we have to show is that not only is there a backlash against this anti-women's 
rights behavior. Not only do we intend to end the war on women, we're going to the next stage, and this is the perfect setup for Congresswoman Ohlone. We must score the Equal Rights Amendment, and we must not only score it, we must get ourselves into that Constitution so we never have to face a Scalia or a Bork where they can tell us you're not here to be protected against sex discrimination. We can do it, and we will do it. Carolyn Maloney was first elected to Congress in 1992. She's a national leader who has accomplished many firsts. She's the first woman to represent New York's 14th Congressional District, the first woman to represent New York City's City Council's 7th District, where she was the first woman to give birth while in office, <laughs> and the first woman to chair the Joint Economic Committee for the House and Senate. Only 18 women in history have chaired congressional uh, committees. As a former co-chair of the Women's Caucus, Carolyn Maloney is a nationally recognized advocate for women and family issues, with special emphasis on funding for women's health needs, reproductive freedom, and international planning. Representative Maloney helped pass legislation that targets the demand side of sex trafficking, provides annual math grants for women on Medicare, and increases funding for law enforcement to process DNA rape kits, a bill uh, uh, that was termed the most important anti-rape legislation in history. Her efforts also created women's health offices in five federal agencies, and she's been an outspoken authority against the persistent problem of sexual assault in the military. She's worked to increase public awareness of social inequities between women and men that still exist in the United States, particularly the wage gap, and she reintroduced the ERA. On our first day in office, as new officers in 2009, we were thrilled to stand with Representative Maloney at a press conference announcing the reintroduction of the ERA which she has done in every session since the 105th Congress. After that, I have seen her at event after event and on conference calls urging support and demanding constitutional guarantee of equal rights for women. And this year, we all cheered when you expressed the fr frustration that we all felt with the Government Oversight Committee when you asked, where are the women? And we walked out in protest. You started a fire storm and you made people recognize the absurdity of this vicious war on women. You are our hero and we thank you for the impact you have had improving the lives of women and families. And I am pre pleased to present you with this Woman of Impact Award. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much and thank all of you. Uh, it's so wonderful to have an organization like NOW that is truly dedicated to supporting women. And I can tell you in my campaign when I challenged a 15-year incumbent Republican who outspent me five to one, no one thought I could win. All the major women's organizations were endorsing my male opponent, because he was pro-choice, never mind that he couldn't convince any other Republican to agree with him, they were still endorsing him. Save now! And uh, Patricia Ireland came to New York and organized the now members in New York to support me, and I will never, ever forget it. Times wrote an article that now is wasting their endorsement by endorsing a woman. And uh, uh, this woman couldn't win. So I had to call him up and I said, how do you know she couldn't win? You know, if you don't endorse her or help her, how in the world is she going to win? No one thought I could win. And uh, now played an important role and it's wonderful that you are here dedicated to helping women. Because so many people are not. And I call now the NRA of the women's movement. <laughs> because you're in every neighborhood, you're clear 
across the country and you can organize on the neighborhood level. And I just have to ask, are there any New Yorkers here? Any? Hey, great. Uh, and I see some like-minded men, so it, it's great to see you. So NRA is on my mind since part of yesterday was spent uh, fighting for Eric Holder against the NRA with that ridiculous uh, contempt uh, charge against him, which had nothing to do with combating guns on the southern border. If they wanted to combat guns, they put in a bill to, to outlaw assault weapons and, and make a trafficking a federal offense. But no, they had some paperwork. It was outrageous. But yesterday was mainly a day of great wins. Now the health bill is the law of the land. What a great, great achievement. And I joined many senators and, and members of Congress on the steps of Congress, uh, of, the, of, of the Supreme Court, uh, in, in support. Uh, when we heard the report, we were in a caucus meeting of the Democrats, and we literally jumped out of our seats. We were so ecstatic. It was such a hard, hard bill to pass. When I was a young woman working for the Speaker of the New York State uh, Legislature years ago, that was our goal, and it took us so many, many, many years to achieve it. And uh, it will do for women what Title IX did for women in education and sports. It is very, very important in ending discrimination and in uh, treating women like we, we are not a pre-existing condition. <laughs> and I can tell you, so many women have told me they couldn't even get uh, insurance to cover the birth of a child. Uh, so this is truly a, a tremendous step forward in so, so many ways. And uh, thank you, President Obama and everybody who worked hard for it. And I've got to say thank you, uh, President Obama, and one of the reasons we have to get him elected is the Supreme Court. Let me tell you, we could not pass Roe v. Wade in the United States Congress today, believe it or not. So many gains uh, for, for rights for people were achieved through the courts, and that's why his appointment of Elena it was so important, Kagan and, 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 and Sonia Sotomayor. And when they were, I was told when they were discussing the immigration uh, bill in the Supreme Court, one of those right-wing justices literally asked her for her papers. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> They're not that bad. They're pretty bad, but not that bad. But the Supreme Court is another another reason that we have to re-elect uh, President Obama and, and make it an absolute uh, top priority of our country. I see so many important women leaders here, but I do have to mention Martha Burke. I had a book party for her yesterday, and if you haven't had a chance, uh, you need to uh, purchase her book that gives many ways of how to get out there and do things to make things happen. What can I say? It's a day and a year of great advancements for women. I, I, I know the, the Don't Ask, Don't Tell, we're going to repeal DOMO, we're going to do so many things on gay rights, and we're doing so much in so many areas uh, to help uh, women and elect women. Debbie Wasserman Schultz, I share a house with her in, in uh, Washington, and we have a woman head of the DNC, which is uh, fabulous. We have so many achievements. Uh, but still, there is a backlash like I have never seen before in my lifetime, and I know uh, the AAUW has been working on it, and, and all of my friends in Congress have been working on it. I don't quite understand why it's happening now, but it is literally the worst that I have ever seen. Now, they get upset, the pundits, when I call it a war on women. I said, you can call it whatever you want, but all the casualties are women. Whether you're going out to cut programs that benefit our health care, our children, our supportive needs, our balance between work and family, uh, whether it is an assault on choice, I'm used to assaults on choice. I keep a choice uh, scorecard on my, on my website, and there have been over 174 votes in the House of Representatives that have passed chipping away at choice. But quite frankly, I'm not used to, a, to assaults on access to birth control. I thought that was a consensus issue. And uh, yet, we were having a hearing where they literally were trying to roll back uh, women's access to insurance uh, for reproductive rights, including birth control and other health needs. And they didn't have one single woman on the panel. So I just asked the obvious question, 
where are the women? And they literally refused the Democrats our choice of a witness, which was Sandra Fluck, a law, a law student at uh, George Washington. And they wouldn't let her speak. I would say any woman is more qualified to speak on, on women's health than any man. But in any event, it started a reaction because people across this country were seeing these constant rollbacks. In the great state of Virginia, the birthplace of democracy, they literally passed a bill. It was rolled back by the governor that required a vaginal sonogram uh, before you could have an abortion. A vaginal sonogram. The definition of, of rape is penetration against a woman's will, penetrating her with a sonogram. I had a sonogram, they rubbed something on my stomach. What are they talking about? It was an outrageous insult. And when you look at what is happening, it is stunning in its scope, appalling in its indifference, and I would say outrageous in its uh, disrespect uh, for women. In 11 states, there are ballot initiatives that would literally roll back our access to birth control. Quite frankly, we won that victory so long ago, I'd even forgotten that it was an issue. <laughs> I, I thought birth control was an accepted part of the laws of the land of America. But literally, there are ballot initiatives to roll back access to birth control. And, and it seems like this right-wing right crowd, they seem to try to be outdoing themselves with outrageous bills on the state and local level. In the state of Georgia, in the rape definition, they no longer call women that are raped victims. They're called accusers. How insulting. It hasn't passed, but it's a bill. So there are all these sort of over-the-top things. Uh, when I went to Congress in 1992, the first bill I worked on was the Violence Against Women Act. Such an exciting bill. We did it in a bipartisan way. It's been reauthorized many times. But as we heard from Terry, it has not been reauthorized in the 21st century. What in the world's going on? And, and the fair pay for fair, fair work that did not pass the United States uh, Congress in the Senate in, in the 21st century. They literally repealed the funding for Planned Parenthood that provides primary care to one in five women in America in the House of Representatives. It was restored in the Senate. But quite frankly, it's the worst I've ever seen. And I don't quite understand why it's happening at this time. But thank goodness there's organizations like NOW and leaders like Ellie and uh, all of you at the, at the panel here that are going to, to work to, to turn around this and, and, and uh, change it. I, I, every year I, I reintroduce the Equal Rights Amendment. And uh, our founding mothers, and I think now, Bonnie, should have one of your conferences in Seneca Falls. Yes. I think we should go back yes. and have a conference in Seneca Falls where it all started. And, and our founding sisters were, were truly brilliant. They had two goals, to get the right to vote, from which would come all power, and we would use that vote to elect like-minded women and men. And secondly, to engrave in the Constitution uh, equality of rights for all, including women. And Scalia has literally come out and said that women are not in the Constitution. Of course, he's the one who said that corporations are people. Corporations are people. <laughs> but women are not in the Constitution, and if a discrimination case came to him, he, of course, would vote against uh, any rights for women since we're not in the Constitution. I I'd say that that is a battle cry. Let's go out and get in the Constitution. And, and uh, let me tell you, women, we do have the impact if we use it, and we don't realize the power that we have, and we can use that power with like-minded men with the vote. And we have an election coming up. If we would score the Equal Rights Amendment and really do it and make women and women would respond and not vote for someone who has not co-sponsored the Equal Rights Amendment, we could pass it. You know, we're 51% of the population and we vote in greater numbers than men. We have tremendous economic impact. Um, I do reports, uh, and I use my seat on the Joint Economic Committee to fo focus on women and the economy. I did a series of uh, studies on women. One was a new look at the glass ceiling. 
uh, that looked at 74% of the women in the workforce, not when they enter the jobs, now we, because of now and other organizations, we may enter at the same pay, but five years out, when they are promoting people, even in times of, of great prosperity, they don't grow the wealth for men and women, they grow the disparity between men and women. And the gap in one category fell 18 points. And women lost ground five, point, five years out, except in two fields in which we dominate in leadership, healthcare, and in, in education. So there's still tremendous um, disparity. The entire time that I've been in Congress, and literally 10 years before I went to Congress, um, we've been stuck at 77 cents to the dollar. When I started working, we were 59 cents to the dollar, but we got, we're now up to 70, it's still unfair, but it's stuck. It's even harder to change than the mind of a Boehner. And, 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 and I mean, we're stuck, and, and that's a, that, that should change. It, with the, and, and so there's so many things out there that we could change. Yet a lot of my time and energy in Congress, and yours as an organization, is fighting to hold on to what we already won. We thought we won access to birth control. We thought we won violence against women. We thought we won equal pay for equal work. Uh, but they are constantly trying to push back. So let's get these rights engraved in the Constitution. And I would say, let's, let's, uh, Let's get a group, if we would go after it, and end the Citizens United decision, which is the worst decision that this court gave us, uh, that corporations are people and can spend as much as they want. It has changed the face of politics. They're coming in in the last three weeks and literally buying elections and defeating people uh, with the money in politics totally unlimited. And I think we should go back like the, the three amendments that, that we used for uh, the abolitionist movement. Let's do the Equal Rights Amendment, let's do, let's do uh, Citizens United, and let's push Justice for All, uh, Gay Rights Amendment, or, or Equality of All People Amendment, and, and, uh, and really go out and try to, to change this. If we could would score this and hold people accountable uh, we win. Now one of the things that I say to the women's movement, I say, why don't we just one year just make it very clear. Let's not have 15 different issues. Let's not have 65 different issues so that they can pick and choose and say I'm for one of them. Let's just say equality. Why can't we have equality in our Constitution? And in my old age, I've been fighting all my life for rights. Now I'd like to fight to make sure that those rights stay there. Because now I spend half my time, or three-fourths of it, holding on to the rights that we already won. You know, if we had a constitutional amendment, they couldn't be rolling back uh, as they will do. If, if we had the constitutional amendment, we would not be discriminated against in, in our health insurance. And so the, the effort that they are making that will be financed by, by a lot of financial interest to roll back the health care bill wouldn't be there. So I, I really feel that, uh, we need to get out there and, and take care of business. Now one thing that I'd like to do is, uh, all of you, when you go home to your states and to your congressional districts, call your senators, call your members of Congress, and find out if they're on the Equal Rights Amendment. And if they're not on it, say, uh, why not? And if they won't go on it, organize against them. Say, I am going to support your opponent and work very, well, try to get them on it. But we've got to hold people accountable. Look at the fights that our sisters had to give us the right to vote. It took them 79 years. Well, I don't intend to wait that long. We, we need to get this done now. Now, now, right? So uh, let's go home and score your members of Congress and get back to me. Get back to me and now. If you would hold them accountable, we could pass the Equal Rights Amendment. It's not up to Congress, it's up to you. That's how we got the vote. We went, we went district by district, state by state, and just came back and ran over the barricades of Congress and forced to vote on it, and got it. So uh, I, I say, um, help me. 
and help yourself. Uh, and and let's, uh, let's finish this uh, very important uh, chapter. And we're very fortunate. We have Ellie Smeal here to lead us. And she's already been through one battle, so she knows the story. And we have a lot of leaders here. So I just uh, want to thank you for this award. I want to thank you for what you do every day. And just close with what Eleanor Roosevelt used to say when she closed her speeches, it's up to the women. It's up to you. If we want to get equal rights, we have to go out and demand them. They're not going to give them to us. And we need to go out and demand them and hold them accountable and pass the Equal Rights Amendment. Thank you so much. I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you.